Welcome back to Old War Stories with Uncle Jay. This one is entitled IBM and Son. Okay, this dates back to multiple times in the 80s. We'll call it four. I remember a good four. It would have been a Saturday. Um, my dad worked for IBM, as I've stated before, and he worked there for years and years in New York City. Now, uh, on a Saturday, he well, he worked Monday through Friday, but occasionally he would be able to pick up a weekend, and the weekend paid buku bucks. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> we will leave it at that. So he would try to work every weekend possible that he could be scheduled for because he wanted the extra money. And not to mention that would still make up his five days a week. So the following week he might be off on Tuesday or Wednesday or Wednesday and Thursday or just something like that. Whatever it was, he would just be off a couple more days during the week. And that was it. And sometimes it was nice because he'd work the weekend. So he'd work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then take off Thursday and Friday from the preceding weekend, be off the next Saturday and Sunday. So he'd be off for four days. So it was well worth that extra going to work those few days to have that nice little mini vacation off to take care of stuff around the house or make like a lion, you know, whatever it was. Anyways, it was one of these four times, I, this kind of all goes into a conglomeration of all four of them. Uh, my dad would take me with him on Saturdays because the office was dead. Now he didn't work in the office. <clears throat> in fact, he didn't even have a cubicle or anything like that. He was what was called a field technician. So he would just show up into New York City Monday through Friday and wait around. Where do you go to wait around? There's a million places in New York City. <laughs> so he would go and hang out and do whatever he had to do. And uh, he'd wait for a call. And sometimes there were one or two calls, and they were very simple things. Other times it was busy all night. And other times he would play hooky. <laughs> In other words, he'd get a beep on his beeper, on his brick, and the call would be for somewhere way downtown in Manhattan, and he'd respond and say, okay, I'll take it, but I'm all the way uptown over it somewhere, so it's going to take me 45 minutes or so to get down there, which was a reasonable expectation. It also so turns out that he could drive into Manhattan in about that same time. So occasionally he would wait at home until a beep came in, and then he'd go, because you'd hear the beeper go off, and then my dad would just go, Ah, oh, shit! Because <laughs> he knew he'd probably have to go in. Not always. Sometimes another technician uh, got the call, but this time, and these four times, he said, Son, I'm going to take you to work with me. In 1980. Four or five, I'm thinking late, very, very late, like November 1984, we got our first home computer, and it was, of course, an IBM. What else would you get? The problem was the IBM PC, the quintessential PC that every other PC-compatible computer was based off of uh, up until present day still has its ancestry in this old IBM PC that was released in 1981. 
but around 1983, I think it was, IBM released one for home use called the PC Junior. Uh, it failed in the marketplace, and IBM had warehouses full of these things that they couldn't sell. So they decided to have an employee garage sale and sold these things. I think, I seem to remember my dad bought the PC Junior for $400 in 1984. An impossible price for an IBM compatible, almost a true blue IBM. I mean, it was a true blue IBM, but it was, you know, the bastardized version of it, if you will. For $400 back then was impossible. The IBM PC would go for three, four thousand, five thousand dollars to get for $400 was the deal of a fucking lifetime. Now, it wasn't no 400 bucks, because that was the box. The box didn't do you any good, because then you needed a memory upgrade, and that went for this amount. Then you needed a printer sidecar attachment, and another sidecar attachment, and a power attachment to run all of the attachments with a separate power supply, and a monitor. Could you hook it up to your TV? You sure could. It had a composite out, but you didn't want to. <laughs> so we had the IBM PC Junior monitor, color monitor, to go with it. And also, you have a computer, you're going to want a printer. So he also bought an IBM Pro printer, which I think he said also cost $400. That was a fortune back then. $400 for a printer and $400 for an entire PC. I know it was just a box, but even so, considering that printer was a lot of money based on the deal he got on the computer. Well, anyways, he got that, and that's what sparked my interest in computers, and it was at a very early age after messing with this that I became very intrigued with this thing called the computer. It had games. They came on floppy disks because hard drives, what's that? That's for rich people. There were some floppy disks that you could put in the computer, turn it on, and the machine would boot the disk up and here's the game. And it would just work. Just put in the disc, turn it on, and there's your game. There were other ones that didn't work that way, and you had to boot up DOS, or the Disk Operating System. And although this is not being released in the month of December, this would be a very, very, very minor mention of DOSember, D-O-S-C-E-M-B-E-R. You can look that up and find all sorts of computery things for December. Anyways, the PC Junior, like I said, was the bastardized version of the IBM PC. Nonetheless, it ran a lot of the same software. And I mean an awful lot. Pretty much with the exception, with, with with a couple of handfuls of games that we got and programs that we got over the years, everything ran perfectly without any problem. And we even did upgrades to the machine. We up upgraded the RAM at one point, and there was even a hack where you could change the crystal oscillator in it and then add in a couple of other uh, bodge wires and shit like that and speed the 4.77 megahertz, that's right, not gigahertz, megahertz processor to 8. That was a huge upgrade. And there was also the NEC V20 or V30, whichever one that took, I think the V20, that replaced the 8088 processor that was in it for something like a 15-20% performance boost. So we had a sped up, maxed out memory PC Junior. This thing was a monster. Had no hard drive though. But nonetheless, I was intrigued and I started reading the listings for basic programs 
and I I was in the early stages. I said, Daddy, how come you put this disc in and it just boots right up? But that one you have to load DOS first. And then I learned about this thing called a batch file and a bootable disc and all these things. And that, like I said, sparked my interest. But as I was saying, getting back to going to work with my dad, the PC Junior was the bastardized version. So it didn't have a lot of capabilities that a PC could and couldn't run all the same software. And one of those programs was 7-Up Spot. The game was um, Othello, I think, or a variant thereof. And it had the 7-Up Spot characters, you know, with the legs and shit like that. And they had arms and sunglasses, and they were cool. And it had this funky, fucking wavy green background, and it was a fun game, and we couldn't run it at home. The PC Junior just did not have the capabilities. So my dad would tell me, get a box of discs, get some shit that you can't run, and bring it. And we'd take a trip into Manhattan. And we went into Manhattan, and if there were no calls, we'd hang out at the office. Now, like I said, my dad didn't have an office or a cubicle, but he knew co-workers there who did. And some of them he became friendly with over the years. And he figured that they wouldn't mind if their kid used their computer. Back in these days, there was no password protection. There were no screensavers where you have to enter a password. There were no screensavers, for fuck's sake. For the most part, a lot of screens had burn-in on them. Because the same image would sit there over the weekend. IBM was burned into the CRT. And that's just how it was back in the day. And that's what gave rise to screensavers. And then we realized, hey, other people shouldn't be snooping through your stuff. Let's make passwords. And then all that came about. Do you mind with this tale? That's been going on for a while now. There. <laughs> Anyways... <laughs> anyhow um there was none of that stuff and we would just go there and use their computer in fact there was another cubicle that um he knew a lady that sat there and she had a candy jar piggy bank basically it was a glass jar with a little piggy bank on it and she kept jolly ranchers the hard candies in there and you'd put a quarter in there and take one. It was the honor system. It wasn't locked up or anything. you just take it, uh, drop your change, and that's it. And you could put whatever, you know, she said you look nice today. You give her a couple extra coins or whatever. Sometimes you cheat and you throw a nickel in there. Whatever it was, you know, she just did it to be nice to people. And it was just there. So oftentimes we'd raid that, and my dad would have to, like, shove a buck in there, you know. <laughs> And I got to sit there and play on these IBM computers. There were some of them were fucking two eighty sixes, really marvelous fucking machines for the time, and it was great. And then we'd sometimes go on calls. Occasionally there'd be a call, and there were a few I could remember. One was at a store that. Sold clothing. I don't know what the name of the store was or where it was in Manhattan, but it was there. And we went there and they had IBM cash registers. Yes, IBM made cash registers. And that was a whole system in itself. You have seen these IBM cash registers all over the place. I think they even still make them to this day. You've seen these things around. The customer display back in these days... You had either the LCD version, which had like a calculator looking display, and then it had six green lights underneath that would say total, change due, subtotal, you know, this, that, and the third, and the display would just read whatever the read out whatever the amount was, and then the light would tell you what the number was. 
and you'd go from there. Or, you know, item price, as they'd ring the stuff up, it would flash the price on there, like a customer display does nowadays. And then they went to uh, the vacuum fluorescent displays, which were the fucking greatest. That turquoise bluish two-line character display. Mm-hmm. You know the ones I'm talking about. And nowadays, I think Walmart even has a variant thereof that I think is like LCD backlit. It's white now. Ugh. Anyway, at least the one here does or did. I, I don't even know what they haven't been there in a while, but they had a cash register and IBM, I don't know if IBM sold hand scanners, but they could be interfaced with one. The most popular scanner and pretty much the only one that a company would buy was made by Symbol. S-Y-M-B-O-L. You've seen them. You know them. They're around and they have the little scanny red light that goes back and forth and that. Well, these scanners get dropped all day long and they're built pretty rugged. At least they were back in the day. They're pretty rugged. Even today they can still take some abuse. But back in the day, I mean, they were built like tanks, and they would work, but occasionally you'd get one that would fuck up, and it could wreak all sorts of havoc with this IBM register. So I don't know exactly what the deal was, but we took a call at this clothing place, and my dad said, Hi, I'm here from IBM to fix your register that's down. And uh, he says, I got my son with me here. Hope that's okay. And it, it was. It just was. And I was behind the counter in a store. And there's other cashiers. Cash were opening and closing. You know, I could just... But I wasn't that kind of kid. So anyways, that was that. And you just took it on faith that things were going to work out and people were nice people. And not unscrupulous. But I remember my dad saying to the guy, so uh, I don't know if they have another register they're going to put you on or something. He says, well, I don't know. Um, I guess I got to, you know, I don't want the boss to see me just standing here while you're working on that. So my dad says, I don't know, straighten up the socks or something. <laughs> it was funny. So anyway, we were there. And it turns out whatever problem was with this register, the scanner was wreaking havoc with the machine. So he unplugged it and said, you're going to have to run this without the scanner and you deal with your company to get that replaced because it's not IBM equipment. And whatever the store did, they did. There was another place, don't remember what it was or have any further details about it, but we went and we went in and they had a down register, I think it was also, and we went in there, and uh, my dad says, Hi, I'm here from IBM to fix your machine. She said, Where are you from? Uh, IBM and son. The lady didn't quite get this. And she said, Okay, let me go to the manager. Come, come with me. So we went with her, and she went to the manager, and she said, hi, I have the IBM and Sun here guy, guy here, rather. I have the IBM and Sun guy here. <laughs> she didn't get it. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so anyway, we fixed that. And there was one other one, again, with a register at a place called, you may have heard of it, now out of business, called Tower Records. And their flagship store was, where else? That's right, not fucking Michigan, New York fucking city! Where else would it be? <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> fan twerp. Anyways, <clears throat> um, it was Christmas Eve on a Saturday. Now, we're Jewish, so we don't give a fine fuck through a rolling donut about that. And my dad said this would be absolute prime time because stores are closing at five or six nobody's going to be around it's going to be great and we got a call at tower records they had a register down i don't remember what it was but the manager guy was awesome 
be. The manager guy was awesome. He had a little, you know, Santa hat, the red thing with the little on it. And, you know, he had that. And he was in a very jolly mood, shall we say. Um, and I remember him thanking my father profusely for coming out on Christmas Eve. And he said, uh, could I interest you in a little Christmas cheer? <laughs> and I asked my dad what that meant, because I was a young kid. I didn't know what that meant. He had a bottle of booze in the back. He was going to give him some. But my dad declined, and that was it. But a lot of the calls that we did get were on big mainframe laser printers. Okay. <sighs> this is a long one. In fact, let me just see what we're at. Oh, 21 minutes, not bad. This is going to be a good 30 minutes for sure. Maybe even 35. So hang on. Okay, whoa, whoa, hold everything here. This video is getting way too long. So I'm going to break this up into multiple parts. So we're going to end it off right here. And next week on Sunday will be the next installment of this. I thank you very kindly for watching. Make sure you click like. Make sure you click subscribe and stay tubed because next week will be the next part. Bye-bye.